This is Hethel. In case you didn't know, it was built as an RAF bomber base in World War II. It was used by the US Air Force. There's been many momentous moments in its lifetime, when the planes arrived and when they left. And then in 1966, it was bought by Lotus Cars to build a factory. Perhaps its most important moment though, was in 1994, when a group of engineers over there came up with a plan to build a car that would save the company. It was, of course, the Elise. The Elise is one of the most important cars in Lotus history. You see, Lotus had been in some serious financial trouble in the 1980s. Then it was saved after a consortium of British businessmen bought in. But it didn't last. In the late 1980s, Lotus was bought by GM and Toyota. Toyota bailed out just four months later, and then in 1993 it was sold to a holding company in Luxembourg, then to a man who owned Bugatti, and then to Proton. It was during this time of uncertainty that the Elise was conceived and born. And while Lotus was just becoming the plaything of many other people, it gave the company some center. And when it arrived, boy, did people like it. The Elise was everything people wanted from a Lotus. It was lightweight, it was nimble, it drove like a proper British sports car, and it was simple. They followed up with the Exige, a hard-topped, more powerful, generally more track-ready version of the Elise. And in the 21 years since, the two have pretty much kept Lotus going. Sure, there's been the Europa S, and what a success that was, and the Evora, but without these two cars, Lotus would not have survived. Now, after 25 years and three different versions of both Elise and Exige, it's time to say goodbye. And so confident are Lotus that this is the end that they've stamped final edition to the side of both cars. And where better to say goodbye to these sports car icons than here at their home? The first, some numbers. 1.8 litre, four cylinder engine, three and a half litre V6, both supercharged. 240 horsepower, 397. 244 Newton meters of torque, 420. Not to 60 in 4.1 seconds, not to 60 in 3.7. 45,500 pounds, 64,000 pounds. They might look quite similar, but these are actually two very different cars. The recipe for the Elise is as old as Lotus itself, if not older. A lightweight two-seater sports car, it weighs just 922 kilograms. So little that I increased the mass here by nearly 10%. Now you may notice that I am, well, I'm not at Hethel anymore. Unfortunately, one of the things that happens sometimes with filming is that uh, footage just dies. So unfortunately, you're gonna to have to live with me chatting you through all the things I was going to say in car. But just imagine I'm sat inside a Lotus rather than stood just away from the start finish line at Goodwood and we'll all be fine. The Elise itself was everything people wanted from a Lotus, something quick, something light, something fun to drive that had all of the spirit of an old British car. The Elise is just an almost incomparable enjoyment unless you go out and buy a kit car. You have to go down below production numbers to find something quite that fun. The steering is unassisted. The brakes are really unassisted. There's not a lot of traction control on show. Everything is you and the car. The engine, well, the engine's there. It plays its part. You can't really have a car without an engine, let's be honest, but it's nothing special. It's all about the chassis. It's all about the driving feel. It's all about the setup of that car. The best way to drive an Elise when you come to a corner is really just to chuck it in, get off the throttle, turn it in, and everything will just be fun. The back end will start to come around. If you are somewhere where you've got a little bit more room, you can play a bit with the throttle, try and keep it going, but the throttle is really only there to sort of gather things up at the end. It's all about that steering feel. The fact that you can be pinpoint on turning, you know exactly where you're going to go. And if there's someone stood on a corner filming you, you know you can get pretty close without ever worrying that you're gonna hit them. The chassis control is excellent. The suspension, Lotus tell you, 
what they do is they have soft suspension and firm damping and you can really feel that the car will roll which is something loads of cars are absolutely terrified of these days but it's not a problem that is why you can get that rotation without having to absolutely mash the throttle that is why you can chuck an elise around and have a lot of fun but it's not the kind of roll that is terrifying. It's not the kind of roll that makes you feel like the car is gonna be out of control. You know exactly what's gonna happen every single time and you can control it the way you want to. You're never gonna be concerned about the roll. You're never gonna worry that it's forming itself into some gelatinous blob that's just gonna end up off into the kitty litter if you're on a track or on the road. You don't worry about the fact that it's gonna fly off without any warning. The Elise communicates everything to you as if it's trying to send you Snapchat messages and it's 15. It is incredible how much information you receive through your hands and through your ass, to be honest, because the whole chassis is telling you what's going on. The Elise is all about fun. It's all about excitement. The throttle response is fine. The brakes are excellent. And you can actually travel very long distances in an Elise without really feeling tired without feeling fatigued which is because of that soft suspension inside there is nothing there okay there's a dash there's a steering wheel there is a gearbox and there's a couple of seats the seats are excellent they look like they will be the least comfortable things in the entire world and then you sit in them and they turn out to be very very good the dash is now digital which i'm going to be honest probably wasn't really necessary and weirdly you cannot adjust any of the things on it unless the engine's off, which doesn't really make any sense, but then it is a Lotus. It's got an old school removable head radio because why do you need anything more than that and nothing else? The real work of art in the cabin though is the gearbox. Not only is the box itself enjoyable to use and the pedal's perfect for heel and toe, which really helps with the way that it drives, it is a thing of beauty. In fact, it's, it's a work of art. It is a machine lever. The real joy of it though is the open linkage. There's a small piece of plastic surrounding the top, but underneath you can see everything. It's like industrial art. It just shows you what it is and it allows the form to follow the function. And to be honest, it makes the whole interior of the car. You don't need anything else in an Elise. You don't need anything else in an Exige. The Exige is the same, except in this case, it's orange rather than blue. That is the only difference between the interiors of the two cars. When the Elise goes for fun, the Exige goes for lap times, but they still share a very similar feel. Obviously there's the engine rather than a four cylinder in line from the Elise, there's a V6 in the Exige. The Exige uses its own version of the same bonded aluminium chassis. It has a unique rear subframe and aluminium double wishbones all around, which gives it a completely different feel when you're driving. It is, firmer there's no denying that but it still manages to feel like it's not too firm it's never going to jiggle you to death when you're driving around the roads but what it does do is send feedback to you as if you have plugged yourself into the usb ports rather than your phone it is communicative in a way that very few cars manage to be today both through the chassis and through the steering and through all of the other emotions that it sends to you the one problem I have with the Exige is the noise that it makes. And that's because of what I'm gonna call the trumpet valve. It's very quiet. All you get is a mechanical noise until you hit about 5,000 RPM, at which point a brass band for some reason starts playing behind you. It's a little bit too much for me in a car that isn't too much in every other way. When you drive the Exige though, there is more adjustability from the throttle because you've got a lot more power, again, going just to the rear wheels. You can bring the car around on the throttle, but the front is pin sharp. So there's no real worry about it snapping. The great thing about the Exige compared to say, a couple of the more modern really nailed down 
super or sports cars is that you never worry that it's going to snap on you. You don't have that fear that you're going to go faster and faster and faster, pushing harder and harder, as it encourages you to do, but that at some point it's just going to go, nope, you're going to die now. The Exige is going to tell you everything you need to know and just let you know when it's going. There'll be a shimmy, there'll be a shake, there'll be things that just let you know that perhaps it's not quite happy. Suddenly the grip won't be quite there. You'll feel a little bit of slide from the front end. There is push from the front end through the mid corner if you put the power down a little bit too early, but then it is a mid-engine car and there's no weight over the front. So that's kind of to be inspected. Well, the engine really feels like it's got more than those 400 horsepower, to be honest. But that thing weighs barely anything. It's an absolute rocket ship when the supercharger starts acting up. And to be honest, the noise from the supercharger is far more interesting than the trumpet sound that it makes. The amazing thing about the two cars is that they've managed to make two so different cars from the same chassis, from the same set of key ingredients. It is incredible what they've done. Those two cars are icons. They have helped Lotus to remain where they are, not just remain where they are, remain an actual company. Let it reach a stage where a large company like Geely can take it over and hopefully take it into the future. But now, our time with these two magnificent cars is short. The words final edition aren't some empty threat. Within the next year, the Elise will be gone. To be replaced with, well, the Amira. To replace it, as we now know with a single car, the Amira is a bold step replacing three cars, including the Evora. To be totally honest, it must be one of the hardest things anyone in the whole industry has to do right now. It reminds me of when Alpine released the A110. If you spoke to anyone working on that project, they'd have told you they'd never felt pressure like it. They were reviving the icon of French motoring, and if they'd got it wrong, they might as well have got their passports and run, or the gendarme would have been after them there and then. If Lotus get the Amira wrong, well, will they be allowed back into Norfolk? Would you find hordes with pitchforks out and about chasing them down? To be totally honest, all I can say to the people developing the Amira is the very best of luck. <laughs>